Well, hello there, Difference Makers. You are in for a treat today. I am bringing along a very incredible friend of mine, Barbara Bruner, to help you implement three super simple SEL routines in your classroom. Barbara has lots of accolades, but let me just tell you, she speaks from her heart's fire any time that she talks about working with students on understanding their feelings and connecting by heart. We have also created a free SEL routine toolkit for you to implement these strategies in your classroom, in person or virtually, as soon as today. Are you ready? Hey, Barbara, thank you for joining us today. Absolutely. I am so excited to be here. And I, I can't, I have to begin with a congratulations on your podcast. I absolutely have loved the sessions and I'm so excited to be number seven. Thank you so much for saying that, Barbara, and thank you for being on lucky number seven today. We are bringing one of the best episodes yet with three strategies you and I have come up with to help teachers implement SEL strategies in their classroom. Yes, and you know, they're simple, but here's the thing, they're simply powerful. They're going to really enrich what you're already doing to connect with the minds and the hearts of your little superheroes. Before we delve into the wonderful information today, Barbara, could you tell us about your journey up to this point? So I've been in education for 36 years, but I like to say that I started teaching in the first grade because my aunt took kind of a busy body bossy little girl and made me her teacher's helper and so she just knew what I needed right so truly I have been teaching since the first grade it's a very long time um, I taught high school Spanish and then I went into high school guidance counseling we don't call it guidance counseling anymore it has morphed into school counseling and I did that for an additional 25 years after I was a teacher for 10 now I'm just able to travel around and help teachers with SEL skills, um, social and emotional learning, character development. I work part-time on the Character Strong team. I wrote the book, What's Under Your Cape? Superheroes of the Character Kind. And I have a picture book coming out next summer. So I'm super excited about that as well. Additionally, I've been married for 29 years and I have three amazing adult children. So I am abundantly blessed. Well, we feel so blessed to have such an expert here today to guide us in this process of helping our students become more aware of their feelings and for us to connect with them by heart. Can you tell us a little bit more about what that means, Barbara, to connect by heart? Well, essentially the content is going to connect with their heads. It's going to be cognition and cognitive strategies and getting them to learn and grow um, in understanding and in academic content. But the social and emotional skills really are meant to grow their hearts, to nurture and support their social and emotional growth. So I like for them to make connections first. The stronger that they are with their relationship and friendship skills, the more content they're truly gonna be able to take on. Great point there. We cannot connect with their brains until we have that personal connection with their heart. Thank you, Barbara. I have had the pleasure of connecting with you through our virtual endeavor with our survival guide, the virtual classroom survival guide. And you have been a great mentor to me. And thanks to you, I feel confident that I can enter this school year and connect with my students by heart, just as you've described. So let's get on to those strategies. But before we do, let's let our listeners know that we have created a free SEL routine toolkit for them to access. All of these routines have resources to help you. So be sure to jump over and grab that. You can find that at teachertony.com forward slash SEL. Barbara, can you tell our listeners what exactly they will find in that toolkit? 
Well, we're going to discuss some strategies and you're going to have a feelings friend hat. You'll find out about that here in a little bit. You're going to have some classroom mantras. You're going to have a journal um, template for your feelings journal book. And you're going to have some prompts to help with um, what you're already doing. Here's the thing. There's nothing magical about SEL. You're already doing it. But now we're just giving it a name and making it more intentional so that it's ultimately more meaningful and sustainable to your classroom family. Great, great point to pull out there, Barbara. You and I were discussing that. I told you that I felt guilty after meeting you because I realized how much I had lacked in this area, but you reassured me and made me feel better by letting me know that I probably am already doing these things, but I haven't just pulled out that name, which is so, so important. Why do you think it is so important that we name SEL and be more intentional about it? Because this work is too important to be left to chance. And so when we make it intentional, and like you're so big on routines, when we make it part of a routine, sometimes just sealing the deal by writing it down, it, that holds us accountable. And, it, and then we're accountable to the work, and it's something that just becomes habit once we make it intentional and an everyday Thing that our kids will ask us about if we forget. Barbara, along with this idea of SEL comes the thought that we should be really focusing more on the whole child. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, here's the thing. Nobody really wants to teach half a child, right? And yet the research says that if we only focus on content, we're only getting 30 to 50% of what a child needs. And so I really like to, even just for mental wellness, for mental health um, support, talk about the feelings, practice the feelings, model the feelings. And at the end of the day, for those of us watching, I brought this to show. When I announced that I was leaving, I had a friend who was able to draw his feelings with a little message, why Mrs. Gruner, why? And for a child developmentally primary to be able to express his um, disappointment and frustration that his friend, his adult friend was leaving. I just thought that that was it, it's just an exclamation point of why this work is so important. That is fantastic, Barbara. Thank you for sharing that experience. And I really believe after our discussion today that those listeners will be able to take these three easy routines that we provide and the toolkit and really get to kids in that manner. Don't you think so? Absolutely. So let's get on to routine number one, which is to do a daily emotional barometer. Barbara, can you tell us what an emotional barometer is? Well, I like to pair it with the weather because think about the weather outside. An emotional barometer kind of asks the kids, what is your weather? Maybe they're feeling happy and that's a sunny day. Maybe they're feeling stormy because there's some anger brewing inside of them. It's essentially a check-in to see how they're doing and ultimately how ready to learn they are. So we have uh, created some easy steps for you to follow to implement the emotional barometer in your primary classroom. So the first thing you need to do is to gather some visuals. We know that our little learners really appreciate a good visual. Barbara, can you share some ideas of some possible visuals that teachers can use? Absolutely. Actually, in our virtual school guide um, classroom survival guide, we have these emotion pops and I've basically just put them on cardstock and written the word on the back so you could, you know, how are you, how is this girl feeling? Who's feeling like that today? You could put them on a popsicle stick. I actually put them on the ceiling. My daughter drew them on the ceiling tiles. So we turned our ceiling tiles into feeling tiles and that would create a movement activity because visual cues 
let's move around underneath the one that we're feeling today. So there's all different ways to do it. Here's the key. The more comfortable, the more you do it, the more comfortable the kids are going to be sharing how they're feeling. So it's, it's really important that we give them, like you said, the permission, but also the practice so they get comfortable being okay because here's what we know, all feelings are important. All feelings are valuable. And sometimes they think it's bad if they're mad, but mad isn't bad. It's just the feeling that's choosing you at the moment. And then we teach them strategies to navigate and manage mad until it's gone. Thank you, Barbara. I really feel that those visual cues are important for students to be able to refer to. So once they have gathered those visual cues, our next step is to put it on their schedule. This is a very easy way to become more intentional about it. When you write it on your schedule, you are just tied to that time of day uh, following through with that activity. So do you agree that it's important for teachers to place their feelings check-in or emotional barometer on their daily schedule and in their routine? Absolutely. And again, a natural time for that is as they're doing the weather outside, they could do the weather inside, but it's not tied to that. You can pretty much check in whenever. You might even just check in as you're greeting them at the door. It's just up to you. But the, the important part is that you put it in there and with intention, do that every day. Barbara, as you mentioned, this can be done at any time of day, but we're going to call this a feelings check-in. Can you tell us what that looks like? So you might just hold up, maybe pick four or five of them, maybe the core emotions, mad, sad, glad, afraid. This little friend, for example, is mad. Thumbs up if you're feeling like this or if you've already felt like this today. To the side, if this is kind of, you're not sure down if that is not how you're feeling today. And you have a chance to just show them a visual cue and ask them if this matches how they're feeling. It's that simple and it could go so fast. Three, four, five different feelings. It might be vocabulary because they may not know the word annoyed yet. Our littles are gonna also need some vocabulary help. But for us to be able to just check in with them and then the teacher gets a quick overview. Oh, Jimmy is mad today. I might need to check on him individually in a little bit. Great explanation, Barbara. And let's not forget to mention that you and I put our heads together and we came up with this idea of a feelings friend. And this is a classroom job that is allotted to one student each day. We've created a hat and a page of stickers that teachers can use when they choose their feelings friend, but could you tell us what exactly would a feelings friend do during the day? I think the feelings friend would basically just at the beginning be a helper and um, they might even be the one to choose the pop and say, how are you, who's, who's feeling like this today? Or who's feeling like this today? <clears throat> but then throughout the day, they could just be looking, just be looking for the friend who might need some additional support. I know you're thinking, oh, my kids are four and five, they can't do that, but they absolutely can. I've been, I've seen it in a pre-K room where little Isabel said, um, Miss, Miss so-and-so, I think Junior needs our help right now because we've put feelings on their heart. And to go home with a feelings friend sticker and explain to their parents that that was your classroom job today, brilliant. I love that. I think that's going to be really effective. Oh, what a touching story, Barbara. And you are right. With enough routine and repetition, our students can definitely be the feelings friend of the day. So thank you so much for explaining that. Let's move on to routine number two. Routine number two is to keep a feelings journal. Now, Barbara, you and I talked earlier and you told me all about your personal experience with journaling through your life. Can you tell us a little more about that? 
Yeah, it started when I was really young and my dad would get visits on the farm from the seed companies and they would leave these little notebooks, you know, just these little spirals. And when dad had too many of them, he would give them to me and I would just use them to write and draw how I was feeling. The blank pages are really good for the littles because they don't need as many lines. <clears throat> Throughout the years, I just continued to fill journal after journal because it became a habit something a routine that i set early early on my most recent one is actually a pre-printed gratitude with attitude journal so here i am um, uh, about retirement age still filling up journal books to express myself get them off of my head and my heart and down into print and picture so those are some awesome benefits that you find and all of us can find, but this is a really great strategy to pass on to our kids and especially around the idea of talking about their feelings. So in our toolkit that we are providing, our listeners will find a blank uh, page for the feelings journal and a whole list of wonderful prompts they can use. Can you tell us a little bit more what that routine would look like in the classroom, Barbara? So I would picture it as being a center or maybe during your writing time. Um, maybe, maybe when you're done with your morning meeting. Now let's get out our feelings journal. And it might be, I feel sad when, so it moves it from how I'm feeling today to how I feel when. Then it sets us up to connect it later when a character in the story is feeling that way. So you can also pause throughout the day and give them the idea, oh, that might be something that we write in our feelings journal. Or, ooh, I wonder what the picture would look like if we were putting this in our feelings journal. So to continue connecting it back to the content, it just gives you a win-win, right? Absolutely. And let's bring out that it's very important to model during this activity. Our little ones are not yet writing, they can, but they very much can use pictures to describe their feelings as well. But the teacher will need to do a lot of modeling in the beginning to help students really bring out those feelings and to start to understand them. Yes, when you're teaching it, it would be a great idea to have an anchor chart that's specifically for your feelings. So I could come in today and say, oh, good morning, friends. Today I am feeling, and that might already be written on the anchor chart, sad. I'm feeling sad because, and I might tell them why I'm feeling sad, or I might let them predict why I'm feeling sad. The beauty of them predicting is you're going to step into their story because they're going to put on you what they might feel sad about. So again, we're just gaining this self-awareness for them and awareness of them and where they've been. Today, I'm feeling sad because my favorite dress had a stain on it, so I couldn't wear it today. And then they can fill in. What would make you sad today? Fill in the blanks so you're modeling how to write it and how to emote around that feeling. Oh, that's just genius, Barbara. Thank you so much for explaining that for us. And don't forget that this is included in that SEL routine toolkit already there for you. So once you prepare, prepare your materials, you are ready to go. With that, let's move on to routine number three, which is to create and use classroom mantras. So for our listeners who don't know what a mantra is, can you give us an easy definition, Barbara, that maybe we can share with our students when we're implementing this routine? It's basically just a short phrase, three, four, five, six words, no more, that they can use to help regulate their emotions. It, it can help calm them down or simply remind them that they can do the thing that they're struggling with. And it doesn't even have to be a struggle. It could be something like, we are surrounded by greatness. That one came from my friend, Tammy McMorrow, who's up in Idaho teaching first graders. And every day she tells her kids, you are surrounded by greatness. And imagine starting your day like that. And then when we struggle, I 
am surrounded by greatness. Like it's just like kind of a booster shot of inspiration and joy to get them through the day. So we could do them as a classroom and then we could teach individual ones as well. I am strong. I am capable and lovable. Peace begins with me. And a fun strategy is tapping it out, actually teaching them to tap it out on their arm. Peace begins with me. So we're crossing the midline and we're making it tangible. And it helps again to seal the deal, to imprint on their heart that they're capable and they're well loved. One of my favorite mantras comes from the movie, The Help. I am kind, I am smart, I am important, and I am a firm believer in affirmations and mantras and their ability to really transform your thinking. So when we get to our students at this early of an age and teach them those habits, it can give them many long-term benefits. Do you agree with that, Barbara? No question, because we're going to believe our thoughts. What we think, we end up believing. And thoughts become feelings, and feelings are real. It is so important that students know all feelings. They're real, they're the ones that are choosing them. They're important, and we don't judge them as good, at, as, as good and bad. They might be uncomfortable or comfortable. They might be bigger or smaller but they're not good or bad, they're just feelings. So if I'm struggling and I can get help from, inhale calm, exhale chaos, then I think I should provide practice and time for them to get used to using that. Now, after teachers create these mantras, which they can actually use the list that we've provided in the toolkit, but after they've created these mantras, this routine will be very, very quick in the morning and it will be very, very powerful. Now, how long do you suggest that teachers reuse their classroom mantras? You know, they could have a different mantra every day. Um, again, I'm thinking of a job. Maybe there's a friend who gets to pick the classroom mantra. If they just have four or five of them, they could do one a day. Maybe you have a Monday mantra and a Tuesday mantra. I like for teachers to be able to make it their own and do what works best for them. But I also think it'd be so great for the kids to help brainstorm the mantras. So I think we've given you about 15 to start, group and individual, but then I can't wait to see what you'll come up with um, together as a classroom family. Such an easy yet powerful strategy, Barbara. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us and really inspiring us to be more emotionally literate for our students. My pleasure. The, um, the power here really is just the fluency so that they'll become emotionally literate as they get chances to practice and grow through understanding the importance and um, mastering their ability to um, emote and, um, and share. This has been so fun for me, Barbara, and I can't wait for teachers to see the toolkit that we've provided along with this information. We've really made it as simple as possible for them to implement these ideas. So Barbara, how can those listening today best find you and connect with you in the future? So there's three major places. Um, my book does have a Facebook page, What's Under Your Cape. So Facebook forward slash What's Under Your Cape. I am on Twitter at Barbara Gruner, B-A-R-B-A-R-A-G-R-U-E-N-E-R. -E -E and then my blog is called The Corner on Character. So corneroncharacter.com. Yes, so much good information over there, Barbara. I've already checked it out. So. Everyone jump over there, learn more about Barbara, and hopefully we have given you something to bring joy to your classroom this school year. I'll talk to you later, Barbara. Take care, Tony.